you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello, hello. All right. So today, Dr. Aquia Boatin joins me on the show. Dr. Aquia is a sought after mental health and relationship expert with over 14 years of experience in clinical practice and education. She specializes in an integrative approach to treating anxiety, trauma, relationship issues, and other emotional concerns. She is the founder and CEO of Boatin Psychotherapy and Consultation, where she partners with organizations in the integration of emotionally aware practices and initiatives. In the media, Dr. Aquia has contributed to media outlets such as CNN, The Washington Post, HuffPost, Black Enterprise, Refinery29, Philadelphia Inquirer, Slate Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and others. Her genuine, empathetic voice adds to the growing culture of mental health awareness. In today's conversation, we discuss Dr. Aquia's decision to become a therapist when she originally thought she'd go into medicine. We discuss what she calls first-generation therapy goers. I love that. And I have to say, the way that Dr. Aquia speaks about therapy, she makes it sound like poetry. It's so beautiful. We discuss trauma, what it is, and she gives us actionable steps to start working through and healing our trauma. We talk about how how Dr. Aquia self-cares, the importance of self-compassion, and the work she does on company culture and ethos. All right, so here's Dr. Aquia, and as always, stay tuned after for my final thoughts. Hi, Dr. Aquia. Thank you so much for being here with me today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. I want to get right in, and I'm, I always am curious, why did you end up in the field you're in? Why did you become a therapist? Mm, that's a good question. You know, I think I, uh, from an early age, had intuitive senses about people. <laughs> I was tuned in to how people feel, um, what they uh, were navigating internally, I think, from the playground. <laughs> I think I had that, mm. that, um, instinct and really what I thought that looked like was medicine and helping people physically was the way that I could exercise and really use this, this ability that I had. Um, but I, I think over time and through some experiences in college and beyond, I realized no, I think this is really the soul of a person that I'm mm. that I'm really drawn to and having empathy around the human experience. So I think that's really kind of how I got into the field. Some of the the tangible things was, you know, were me, you know, deciding not to go into medicine, which I thought was the way. Um, and deciding that I want to talk to people. I want to help them in a sustainable way, change their worldview, their perspectives on people, and most importantly, how they view themselves. Yeah. So talking about going back, feeling tuned in from a young age, mm -hmm. is that something that you would say you just innately were almost born with? Or was that of an influence from your family? Or like, mm -hmm. how do you, where do you identify that, that root? That's a good question too. <laughs> um, yeah, I think both. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think we're we're born with with some grouping of abilities, right? That yeah. are a part of our personality, a part of how our brain works and how we see the world. And I think I see the world through the lens of people and human emotion. Mm-hmm. So I think that was innate and I was born with that. And also my family, I think my parents did a really great job of keeping us around the needs of others uh, through service and caring for people. They were quite caring as people, my parents were and are. And so that was the classroom, I think, that I um, was in from an early age on how you deal with people. It's through caring for them and loving them well. Mm-hmm. Um, oddly enough, my um, a portion of my last name, my full last name is Opoku Boatin. The last portion of my name, Boatin, means caring. Wow. A caring, a caring people is, is what, what it means. <laughs> so That's amazing. Yeah. You're truly aligned, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So, I and, and you said it, you know, I think ca- rather casually going from medical to mental health, but I imagine if you spent much of your life thinking that medical was the way to go, that that might not have been just a snap of the fingers decision. Was that difficult to come come to terms with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was that was quite difficult. Uh, there was a lot of expectation wrapped up in medicine um, that I some of that was self induced, possibly an expectation for my parents and family to live up to some ideal um, that medicine would have brought me. And so changing that and going in a different direction which I hadn't seen before at that time, which was pretty significant. I hadn't seen anyone in my frame of reference um, go into psychology was pretty significant for me um, in that I was going to do something that I had to map out myself. (laughs) Yes. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So in, in, in talking about, you know, having some experiences that, that changed your mind or just changed the trajectory of your career? Were those personal mental health experiences or just world experiences? You mean the, the ones in early adulthood? Yeah. Um, again, both. Okay. Right. I think I navigated some, uh, mental health concerns in my social group in college, obviously, you know, college is a, right. a time period where everyone is reckoning with what they've been taught and what they will do with that. And um, so some of that, I think, was within social groups where I saw a lot of pain. Yeah. And um, it caused me to think about another way of helping, another avenue of helping. And then also... Um, my own, I think my own mental health challenges of trying to fit in a space that was not me. Mm. Right. That for, for some time, I think I really felt like I needed to do this thing that really didn't feel like it was aligned with my soul. (laughs) Right. And the anxiety that comes with that and the expectation and imposter syndrome and all of the things that we, that we talk about today. I think I was probably dealing with some of that myself. Yeah. I think back on that time and it's really quite shocking to me now that at 20 something years old, there's an expectation that we're supposed to know what we're going to do with the rest of our lives professionally. And we barely know who we are then. It's really, yeah. And I, you know, I didn't, I had a, a similar, I guess, experience just changing you know, majors and changing schools within my same university. And, you know, I just remember the the counselor that I talked to, you know, he just looked at me, he's like, this is college. How do you want to remember it? Do -hmm. you want to remember it miserable in this Mm -hmm. chosen major that you think you need? Or do you want to do something you enjoy and that you're, you're good at? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. Option B, please. (laughs) You know, and, and it, yeah, because you're a kid. You're still a kid. So, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, 
I think back on that and I think it's pretty insane, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of responsibility early on. Yeah. And I, I do love what you said about, you know, your family, you know, providing that that classroom for service and helping. And I think about that with my own kids and really feeling like feeling personally called more recently to actively be in service and be volunteering and donating and doing all the things, but also really actually looking forward to when they're at an age where they can understand what we're doing and participate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes, uh, hopefully if it's similar to my story, these are the times that we look back on with so much joy, mm. The, the moments together when we're giving to other people, there is this reciprocity of um, joy and bliss that you get back, yeah. right? Yeah. That you're doing a thing that you were really designed to do, which is to be in a community and a tribe supporting other people. So yeah. it is a common um, um, fond memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So getting, getting back to your expertise, um, how how do you define, you know, s therapy and what can someone who's never experienced working with a counselor before hope to get out of the the uh, relationship? Hmm. I really feel like therapy is um, it's a shared presence and um holding space for um, discovery. It's a holding space for discovery, right? That oftentimes we are moving from one thing to another. We are, uh, we have expectations for ourselves or it's put upon us through society that we need to have things figured out. And there may not be an actual space and time that's devoted to the just, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> right there's not a space to you know of discovery that's just like mapped out for you that allows you to move into like wonder and reason and um to be met in a place of pain mm. I don't think there's any other space like that yeah no I agree yeah right and so therapy provides that for you, mm -hmm. a holding space for discovery, discovery of your own pain, your own patterns, your own uh, potential is three piece, <laughs> your own potential, your future, um, as well as this holding environment for there's no expectation here mm -hmm. except that you just show up. Yeah. Yeah. That is a rare experience. Yeah. I hope that is what you get out of therapy if you pursue it. Mm -hmm. The lesson of there's a space in the world I can just show up. I don't have to be anybody for anybody to anybody. I just get to be me, however that is evolving and, and changing and to what degree I know it or don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you make therapy sound like a hug. <laughs> <laughs> It's very, that way. it's warm and fuzzy the way you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have a, um, just a, a calming presence that is, you know, and in, in, in your voice and, and truly your words. And, and I was also thinking of like, she's writing a book, right? She has to be writing a book because it's, it's actually pretty beautiful the way you, you described it. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. That's what I truly believe. Yeah. So. So all of that, that hug and that warmth, what do you think, what do you wish more people understood? Like what's still stigmatized and what's, what's misunderstood about the experience? Mm. We, we, um, sometimes think pejoratively about things we don't know. <laughs> we just, there's just a lot, not a lot of education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? There's not a lot of education and space for um, 
progress and our pain, right? Like we, we often, I think in our culture, we think about progress as it is divorced from our pain. Like, you know, the grind culture, the, you know, you gotta, you know, suck it up and do it, push it through, you know, rise and grind, you know, this, this idea that progress has to like very much distance itself from any frailty, weakness, pain. And we may have mental images and narratives around therapy, mental health in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if I am, am I, if I'm struggling, if I'm having pain, if I am um, in a space of crisis, I must not be productive or I'm not progressing. Yeah. That's the big stigma, yeah. right? That you're either one or the other, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but we are often both. Yeah, I I have heard versions of that, but that was, yeah, it's so true. And I think that it really, a lot of times when I ask that question, what I hear is, you know, that a lot of people think that something has to be, you know, quote unquote, wrong with you um, to seek help with a therapist that you have to have some big, you know, scary sounding mental illness and it really and it can be for that and and it can be for true illness it can also just be to help you get through a phase mm -hmm. you know just a a sounding board uh, or you know I think I mean to use your word a space a space to just be yeah yeah it's so needed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah who's who's typically coming to you what are what is most of your client base, like what are they coming, what challenges are they bringing to you? Mm. Well, that's evolved over the past year and a half, hasn't it? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, completely different. I have a lot of people that come to me as first generation therapy goers. This is a term that I coined to talk about people that um, they haven't had a model of pursuing professional help. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing it for the first time and they need to know how to do that. And so I'm typically working with people on how to live different, mm -hmm. how to live a life that is um, more enhanced and healthy than your parents. <laughs> and um, so I have a lot of conversations around that. Um, people are also wanting to relate well and it looks different for them in this area of their life right because um <clears throat> they may be connecting later on in life they may be choosing to have children they may have had children and now they're thinking about the fact that they didn't want children <laughs> they may um be in relationships that don't serve them or looking for a relationship to serve them in their new healthier space um, and so there's a lot of transition happening, a lot of growth and how do I live in the backdrop of my growth that I talk about, um, how that bakes out into dis disorder, um, or mental health concern is a lot of anxiety, a uh, great deal of depression, um, uh, intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about intergenerational trauma. I have a lot of uh, BIPOC clients and how do I embrace this legacy of um, an immigrant mentality while also honoring the, spa the space that I'm in now that I actually am living a very different life than my Im immigrant parents and that requires a whole different science to it. Yeah, um, yeah. So those are the things I'm talking about a lot. Yeah, that's um, that's the first I'm really hearing that as well. It put that way in terms of the intergenerational uh, challenges. I mean, I, I I imagine that that sort of buzzy word trauma comes up quite often throughout. I mean, really any of the experiences that you've listed, um, you know, I think trauma. I I, I don't know. I'm curious what you think about this, but. There are quite a few words now that I think the more uh, mental health and wellness 
I don't want to say influencers, maybe content creators, um, actual therapists and, and counselors and people who just like myself who are interested, right? The more talk that we're doing, especially on social media is where I'm getting at. I think there's a lot of benefit, but I also think that some of these words, trauma, boundary, trigger, self-care, they, they are getting, um, they're getting muddied. They're getting overused and they're sometimes even getting misused. Um, and I think that trauma is one of the, the bigger ones. And, and what I see is that it's one that's actually, um, <laughs> Like it's, it's, it's when it's misused, it's, it's so much more detrimental in my view than the others. How do you think of trauma? How would you want, you know, someone listening to understand trauma? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that, I think that's the, uh, one of the mm, liabilities of the popularity of mental health now, <laughs> right? that we worked, worked really hard to um, make it more uh, palatable and um, spoken about, and yet we're speaking about it, right? right. So it's also being hijacked sometimes by culture and um, pop culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but trauma is um, all, I think it's changed in its in the way that we conceptualize it over time as well, which is a fair and valid thing. So that's not just pop culture, the way that we think about it in science and throughout our um, discipline of psychology has changed too. Um, but it's it's really going through a life event that overwhelms your ability to cope. We just use that, that term to describe the after effects, <laughs> right? The way that your body um, maneuvered to get through a thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so the effects is really what we are treating. We are treating the way that your maybe your brain has frozen in a certain way, or it is being replayed, hypervigilance, it's being replayed over and over, right? Or there's rumination, or there's like a distancing, or avoidance, or um, just the way that you had to contort um, that is not serving you. And it's also keeping you in some, in some ways debilitated. Mm. in moments. So trauma is, um, it's an actual thing that's happened to you, even though that definition has broadened. Yeah. Um, but the way that we see that a person has experienced trauma is the after effects and those being um, aligned with the specifiers that we have in DSM or some other um, manual that we're using at the time, um, it's impaired your daily functioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you give some examples? And I'm, I know this is a loaded question, but how would you start to work through some of that? Some, some of whatever mm -hmm. the level of trauma may be um sure. and knowing that trauma is I, this is not my words i've just you know interviewed enough therapists now to have heard this but um you know trauma is in the eye of the beholder right so mm -hmm. it's you know what what are some ways that that someone might start to with with help work through that mm -hmm. um well the first thing is identifying it mm. right that we can't heal what we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so identifying it is, my life is not what I like it to be. Sometimes it's subtle, right? Sometimes it's a, man, I keep finding myself in this situation. I should talk to somebody about it, getting to that person to talk about it, describing it, becoming aware of it, acknowledging it, identifying its effects, what it touches in your life and what it causes a rift around. Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point we're going to name that, right? Based on what we've experienced of it, based on the fact that we can connect it to certain things and to a certain moment in your life, mm -hmm. maybe this is trauma, <laughs> right? So if we name it trauma, what do we want to do about that? We've named it trauma. Okay. The main, the main issue with trauma is that it is, um, it causes disintegration of your system, mm. right? And so healing or health 
as it pertains to trauma is integration. Mm. How do we get th things back online? Mm. What you think and feel, right? Mm -hmm. Trigger and response. Let's put it back together because it's gotten off the tracks, mm. Mm -hmm. right? So in the moment where you went through the trauma and in some way, if I was plugged in completely to my emotion, my brain and my emotion were completely plugged in and I felt all of the things that were associated with this moment, I would have, it would have kind of boom, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Much, yeah. Yeah. too much. So the body, and um, some people say, um, disassociation is God's gift to the traumatized child, mm. right? The ability to unplug it mm -hmm. so I don't feel it fully, right? Head and heart, let me just, just unplug that. Therapy helps you to plug it back in, to get it back online with slow, progressive, tolerance-specific exercises. Mm -hmm. Boom. <laughs> I think that's, I think that about sums it all up. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to wish that, that the listeners can see your, all of your hand gestures, you know, <laughs> showing the unplugging and the plugging in and the, <laughs> that was helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do, uh, I guess, you know, I don't know what, what kind of transition this is, but something I made a note of from your, um, uh, your bio is the consultation piece of your business. Um, and, you know, part the partnerships that you have with organizations, um, emotionally aware practices and initiatives, like what, what is that work you're doing? And what's that about? Yes, I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really well, interesting. A lot of my work really follows along my clients, right? <laughs> my clients needs, right? And so I, you know, as therapists, we work in a room, we work in a, in a room privately and no one really knows about it. It stops there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the pandemic really forced me to think about, uh, my community. It made me think about, um, black people, people of color. It made me think about, uh, how do we make mental health a part of the mainstream conversation not because we need to, not because we want to, because we need to. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people hurting. Yeah. And the way that we've been trained, I believe, is for such a time as this, <laughs> right? We have been trained to really help people to navigate great pain, loss, conflict, strife, issue. And so how do we do that in a larger way? Mm. My clients are often experiencing a lot of mental health concerns at work. Mm. I hear about it all day. Mm -hmm. Right. And so how do we create, um, support to companies that employ clients such as mine, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. To help them to create environments that are safer, that think about people's hearts, not only their minds. Yeah. Right. Um, and how can we do that in a time where we need a culturally specific way of doing that? Right. And so that's why it, it really compelled me to think about it broadly mm -hmm. and partner with organizations that are really wanting to do it, but they need an expert to help them how to, to see how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a great opportunity for me to, you know, provide workshops or webinars or, you know, speaking, keynote speaking, um, curriculum, kind of writing, aud auditing. I've done auditing a little bit. Um, just like, let me look at your process. What, what are you doing? How are you thinking about this? And how can we humanize your strategy, your ethos? Where, where can we look at this? Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that. And then also with organizations, um, that I've partnered with my clients need resources at home. I talk to them for an hour but we may not get to how do you use self-care? Like, what do I use with the self-care? Cause you told me to do a self-care routine and the strategy, like what, what do I, where do I buy this stuff? Where do I get it? What do I, who do I talk to? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, partnerships really look like, how do I support my clients to do the thing that I'm asking them to do? Interesting. Interesting. So I, so going into a, a company, you know, what are, can you give some examples of maybe how you've helped any number of, of companies 
humanize their mission and humanize their their place like what I guess what I I I tr- I want to know if you have specific examples that are you know quick enough to share in a few minutes but but I'm also yeah like this is something I think that needs to be implemented across the board everywhere right so if we can start to talk about what actually needs to be done who knows who hears this and then they go okay let me do this in my business you know I mean we gotta yeah it's it's enough now of of trying to make employees feel like they're not their human needs outside of work don't matter because that happens a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it does. You are right. This is relatively new for me. As far as time I was teaching, I was doing, you know, therapy work. Um, and so now this is kind of a new arm of it. I was doing kind of freelance here and there, but now, (laughs) right. Um, but really what I, I sense as far as ethos is concerned, let's look at your core values. Okay. Let's look at um, how you are approaching personnel issues, how you're approaching things like mental health days, um, how you're approaching um, even productivity and the language that you're using around that and the culture, the tone and culture that you have within your company. What are you um, normalizing? What narratives are being taken from what it is that you in, are t- intending to do? Mm-hmm. Is impact look a little different than what you're intending to do? And then also, let's take a let's take a look at your personnel. Let's take a look at your team members, right? Mm-hmm. How healthy are they? Mm-hmm. What does it look like when they're at work? How do they feel, mm-hmm. right? What are the hours? Right. right. Um, do people feel? Do they feel like they have a voice? Mm-hmm. Can they talk to their supervisor about human concerns, not just logistical ones, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. right? Is there somebody that they can do that to if, with if that were to come up, Yeah. right? Do you have that in your EAP program, right? There's so many different ways to look at this. Yeah. If that is an important thing to you, let's do it. Do you have communi- Do you have talks that are in your company right now, right? That you have moments where you have collectives or groups or after work things that allow people to get into a circle and talk about, wow, we're in a pandemic and we're trying to work. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you have a professional that you are connected with that you can provide your, there's so many, there's so many things to do. Yeah. It's reminding me of, um, the work that Christine Michelle Carter does, I don't know if you're familiar with her. I I had her on the show recently and she advocates specifically for working mm-hmm. mothers, but you know, one of the things that I, that she mentioned that st- sticks with me still, it's a, such a simple thing. She's like, "I don't I don't see why any company needs to hold a meeting after 3 p.m. ever." She's like, "Just stop doing it. No one is as mentally productive and you're you're single-handedly you know, making a separation between the parents and the non-parents, because if a parent needs to leave, it's going to be at three o'clock or later. Right. So, and, and there's just things like that, that I think up until this point, I think specifically the, the pandemic, this might be a, a silver lining coming out of that is, is that these sorts of issues and questions and comments are coming up now, maybe Mm -hmm. not as fast or as often as we want to see, but you're you're in the game now you know and and more I hope follow you because it's a changing it's a changing world I mean it sounds so like hallmarky but it's you know the amount of businesses now too that are not even going back to an office so now what now everybody's home and there's no line between work and home like that there's pros and cons is uh, like you said it's it's a lot to process and people need a space to do that mm-hmm. and Unfortunately, therapy on a one-on-one basis is not accessible for everyone. It's not available or it's not financially possible. So yeah, how great would it be in your work environment to get support? Yes, yes. And that being a response where some, when someone says they have an issue. Yeah. Not, wow, get through it. Not, we demand it anyway, but like, wow you're going through something. How can we support you? Right. Oh, we've already, we've already thought about that actually. Yeah. Here's, yeah. here's three numbers. Take right. the day off. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, it's awesome. Um, 
you you brought up self care. This is something I talk about a lot too. How do you personally take care of yourself? Yeah. That that I think that is the number one question I get. Do you really? <laughs> I think people are interested now. Therapists take care of themselves. Um, so how do you do this thing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are several ways I think I take care of myself. I, um, I typically ease, I typically ease into mornings. That's something that I, um, I've been doing for some years and I said, I really wanted to, um, if I can create the life that I want, I would start work later and ease into the morning. (laughs) And and I did that. (laughs) Right. So, um, yeah, that's something that is important to me and my personality and the way my brain works. So I ease into the day where I can. Um, I take care of myself by getting outside as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. I'm a California girl and I like to be outside. And so um, I try to do that where possible. It's a little different on the East Coast when it's cold. But yeah, um, yeah so I do that. Um, I frame my days quite a bit. So I ease into the morning and then the nighttime, typically around this time, I am turning off high lights. I'm turning on low lights behind me and I am starting candles. I've got music that I start playing. I set the stage for easing my body down Mm -hmm. to rest. Um, And that's been really helpful for me. I talk to my therapist every week and um, non-negotiable, that's what I do. And um, I have a lot of people in my life that can say, you're doing too much. (laughs) You need to sit down, you need to relax. Mm. Um, So that's how I take care of myself. Yeah, yeah, I I ask almost everybody because again, I think self-care is, it's so, you know, we get banged on the head with self-care, self-care is like, it's like, but how, you know, like not only yeah. how in terms of what to do, but like, how do we actually make time for it? And, you know, um, I think it's a, a true challenge, especially given what we just talked about, how much, how much work in life, the line has become so blended. Um, yeah. You have uh, something on your site. I saw wellness essentials. Oh yes, yes, the the newest one. Yeah, I I don't yeah I don't know. Can you tell me about that? Sure. Remember, I told you a little bit about my background. I started in the, you know studying medicine, yeah. and um, did pre med and grad actually graduated with a pre med degree, um, undergrad, and so health has really been important to me in my life, and then also in the way that I talk with my clients about their bodies and like this is all connected and Mm -hmm. what you eat, how you sleep, what you put in your body, how you feel, um, emotionally all connected. And so the wellness essentials is, it looks like, again, everything outside of therapy, typically people come to therapists and they would like us to have a lot of answers, (laughs) right. Around all aspects of their life. Um, but we really concentrate on the therapy part, right? So I wanted to bring in some of the other aspects of, what helps a person to be well, Okay. right? So nutrition, exercise, finding your own personalized grounding, meditation, mindfulness activities that really do help to regulate you or deescalate you in moments, not the same as everyone else, but finding ones that really help you. Um, so mind, body, spirit in the wellness essential a ritual guide helps a person to create that plan for themselves, mm-hmm. right? Foods that will really help you. Saffron helps with depression, right? Being really? able to emo- right omega fatty acids in that comes sometimes comes in salmon can really help with um, regulation and anxiety, right? And so knowing these things about yourself really does improve your sense of autonomy. It improves your overall wellness Mm -hmm. and in turn, it supports your mental health in this really unique way. So I created that guide to help people um, walk through mind, body and spirit 
to create this this ritual and plan for themselves. Yeah, it's, it's I love that. It's and it's fascinating to me. I had no idea that something, you know, like saffron is, you know, mm-hmm. you saw my expression helps with depression and and that there are other other possibilities out there like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there are. And they're not a cure all, right? So right. A lot of, of course in my field will tell you that, right? So they're not a cure all, but it definitely does support, you know, what it is that you're trying to do. And the more that you can know about yourself, you just feel more empowered. Yeah. Right. There is something that you can do, right? Yeah. Your spirit, your spirituality is important. It's not about religion. It's about how you make meaning, mm-hmm. how you make sense of the things that you're you're going through and what you sense about your future. Mm-hmm. Right. Everyone should have a reason why. Yeah. Because that's what you draw upon in moments of despair. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. And it's yeah. all and it's all connected. I mean, it, it's like you said, it's it's rare that someone maybe is experiencing a bout of depression or just going through a hard time and that they're not feeling it physically and that they're not also feeling it spiritually in that perhaps their whole mindset is off, you know, and it, it's all that holistic approach is I, I really um, I enjoy that, I think, because it because it's it, you see it, you feel it. It's all there. It's all together. Yeah. 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 So, um, is there anything, uh, just in the, in the last few minutes here, is there anything related to what you do or mental health or therapy that you, you know, are feel called to talk about or, or share that I didn't think to ask you about today? Hmm. Yeah, I am. People, wherever you hear me, you will probably hear me talk about self compassion. Okay. <laughs> because it is one of the most powerful things that we can use. Um, I find that the average person is quite critical of how they're navigating this thing called life. Mm-hmm. And we know that negative reinforcement is not typically how people get well, it's through yeah. compassion and feeling loved and cared for. And so um, that's something that we have to manually practice before it becomes our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And um, I encourage people to find ways of doing that um, throughout their days, giving themselves grace, telling yourself you're doing a good job, having that self-talk that's really helpful to you, um, celebrating the wins, having gratitude, you know, all of these things that... um, Sometimes we feel are basic, but yeah. they're scientifically helpful to you in lifting your awareness and helping you to see hope. Yeah. You may not have seen it before. So I often talk about that. I think that's important for people to know. Mm-hmm. And you can start wherever you are. Yeah. There is no perfect place. You don't have to have all the resources you don't even know what to do sometimes, you can start anywhere. Yeah. It's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so important because I, I, in my own experience, it's only recently that I'm catching myself in the criticism and in the the negative self talk and because i i would have i would have never said that i was a person that you know sat down on the couch and just spent 15 minutes like talking trash to myself but yeah. you know when i really just go about my day yeah i'm becoming so much more aware and and for me right now I, you know my sort of what I'm really struggling with is, is body image and, and food. And I'm really working through that. And, um, you know, even just earlier today, I, I had a bagel and I felt really bloated and I walked by the mirror and my first thought was, ah, like, oh my gosh, look at that. And then I was like, wait a minute, like you're, I, it's okay. I'm just, I'm bloated from a bagel. Like I'm not an awful human being, a human being. And, but yeah, it's like my initial, like just thought about myself was, okay, no more bagels ever again. And I was just like, what are you? Okay. Just it, calm down, you know, but there were, there's been many years where I wouldn't have caught that. I wouldn't have 
realize that I was doing, I mean, it's like, I, it's like, I'm doing it, but it just, it floats in and it floats out. And, um, you know, it, it takes, uh, like you said, a lot of practice to sort of catch myself, stop, breathe and, and shift, shift the thought, shift the narrative in my head. So thank you for saying that. I, I think it's a, a great message to, share and one that certainly I know I need to hear over and over and over again. It's not a, a one-stop shop with with self-compassion. Sometimes yes. it takes a while. It takes a while. It does take a while. Yeah. And the education that you provide yourself around that thing, I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to really go and look up what the impacts of bagels are in your stomach, right? right? right. In some way, and, and not not to say that there's an impact, but what I mean by that is, let me get some truth around this. Right. Like my body is doing a really beautiful thing right now. Mm-hmm. My body is processing this food to create nutrients for me to be strong, for me to be able, mm-hmm. for me to show up. Mm-hmm kids and my family. That's happening. Yeah. That's next level. I'm not there yet. (laughs) I'm getting there, but I'm not quite there yet. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, Dr. Akwia, this was wonderful. I I really appreciate your time and um, thank you so much. Again, my pleasure. It was a great, great conversation. I am so obsessed with listening to her talk about therapy. She truly speaks of the experience as if she's speaking about art. And I bet she'd argue that in some way she is. I want to reiterate a few quick quotes because I just love them so much. Dr. Aquia described herself as being, quote, drawn to the soul of a person and having empathy for the human experience. She described therapy as quote, a shared presence and holding space for discovery. She talks about therapy as being a place where we can simply show up as ourselves. She says, I don't have to be anybody, for anybody, to anybody. I get to be me. However, that is evolving and changing to whatever degree I know or don't. (laughs) I love it. It's so true, so spot on, so beautifully said. And I hope she has inspired you to learn more about yourself and potentially explore therapy as an option to heal your pain and discover your your potential. So thank you, Dr. Aquia, for your time and your thoughtfulness. You've also given me so much to think about around trauma and how to heal. I love that portion of the conversation. And thank you for listening. That's all I've got. I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. SAS Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sassays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later.